Oh, so um, Don, I wanted to add a uh, uh, postscript to what I, we were just talking about uh, getting organized and getting things done. If you look, if you look at one level above today's activities, this month's activities, and so on. Here's, a, here's another heuristic for the people watching this thing 50 years from now or even five years from now. You have to have a more global vision of where you're going and what you're doing so that life doesn't appear to be just brownie in motion, being bumped around from one little thing to another thing. Uh, a good example is um, the, there's a long chain of activities in my life that stretches from about 1976 to... Uh, well into uh, until about 1990, but uh, it makes a coherent. In, in if you know what was going on, that this pattern act of activities is a coherent plan, very much like the plan that you laid out to all of us back. Uh, what I don't know, more than 30 years ago, 40 years ago, for these volumes, that was a life plan, and it was coherent. You 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 modified it over time, but it was a coherent set of things that gave order to activities. And in my case, 76 was um, deciding that if AI was going to be, uh, the by AI, uh, I mean the artificial intelligence part of computer science, if that was going to be a, uh, a robust discipline, uh, it had to have a robust collection of knowledge. And so I knew that, that with the set of things I was doing, there's no way I was going to write a, an encyclopedia of, of all of AI, but it needed to be done. We, it ended up being called the Handbook of Artificial Intelligence, but I needed to get a lot of help from uh, students and research associates and other people uh, who were willing to contribute to it. I, I guess now, these days, you'd call it a Wikipedia or something like that, but we had a wonderful editor, and from 76 through 83 or 4, we were able to get enough motivation and enough talent together to make a coherent body of knowledge for the field, which tremendously influenced, the, not at Stanford, but across the board influenced the development of the field because people could now buy a book that had it all in it. Now that was one thing. Another, uh, another thing was uh, late uh, 70s, early 80s, uh, capturing the opportunity to <clears throat> to um, transition these ideas from, <clears throat> excuse me, from ivory towers like uh, uh, us at Stanford into companies uh, that is tr getting on board the bandwagon of uh, venture capital people and all, all those kind of people who want to do this uh, so that the ideas can get out there as software. So that was a variety of companies to get involved with, including in the mid-1980s getting involved with a big company. I was on the board of... Uh, of Sperry Corporation. Uh, another example of it was, <clears throat> same period of time, 83, uh, 82, 83. So AI was known to the rest of the world in terms of a few people who were writing grumbly books about AI, like Joe Weizenbaum's uh, grumble about computer power and human reason or other people writing about why AI couldn't be done. Well, what about a book about what was being done and, and, and not only what the Americans were doing, but what the Japanese were, were doing? That was called The Fifth Generation. And it sold a huge number of copies. And uh, you can't imagine how many people have come up to me. I mean, I'm talking about dozens, maybe hundreds over the years, saying, oh, I read that book, and that's what got me into AI, or that's what got me into computer science. I loved it. I was a double E until I read your book. I, may I add that to the list of things that make you happy is when somebody like that comes to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and then uh, later on, uh, Peter Hart from, uh, uh, Peter is an old friend from AI. He, he's been running the uh, RICO laboratory in Palo Alto for quite a while now, RICO Computer Science Lab. He came up by uh, one time in 86 after there were quite a, bit of, quite a number of successes of expert systems. And he said, uh, why don't you just write about the successes? So uh, I did. We went, uh, Penny and I went out and did a bunch of interviews with success, people who had done this successfully and uh, got Pamela McCorduck to help us 
put this together into a book. This is Expert Companies? Yeah, Rise of the Expert Company is what the book was called. Um, and uh, that was a deliberate strategy that gave some shape to what was going on uh, during that period. And to, to get back to what I was saying at the beginning, make sure you don't get into a random walk situation where, where everything in the world is demand driven. Oh, oh, right. Good. Now, uh, actually, you've, you've done very well of anticipating uh, quite a few of my questions that I had on, uh, to ask you. Uh, uh, so that uh, uh, means the work that, that uh, I wasn't too far off uh, as well and that we're in the same bandwidth. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about Japan. Uh, uh, since you know the fifth generation and and and, and Penny have come up already, and uh, uh, you know just in um, I I also remember that uh, uh, when I first came to Stanford, you I asked you uh, who would be a good dentist to go to, and and uh, you said oh I've got this Japanese dentist Mitsufukamura, and and so uh, we had the same dentist from 1969. That's probably before you met Penny. So I'm just curious as to uh, sort of how you. Your love affair with Japan and how you could, how, how Japan uh, uh, came into your life and, and yeah. uh, uh, over the years. <clears throat> uh, there, um, to f to the first approximation, there was no no thought and no contact no cognitive or physical travel to Japan uh, before about nine, uh, early 1970s. And, and, and uh, besides, meeting, besides meeting Penny, uh, who uh, represented for me a, a link into the Jap a real he big link into the Japanese culture. But aside from that, uh, one of the most startling things that uh, you were talking about me being a gadgeteer before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, when I stumbled in on the, uh, I, I happened to s see the uh, Sony Trinitron television, and I couldn't believe the television could be that good. I mean, it was just a revolutionary <clears throat> way of, it's almost like what people regard H high definition now. It's mm -hmm. another jump. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, uh, I, I, that was a, <clears throat> a, a, a kind of a s signal to me that something was going on. Uh, there in 1972, the uh, Jerry Feldman and I went to an IEEE Computer Society joint meeting in Japan, which I think was held biannually. And uh, but I wanted to see more about that, and uh, I wanted to make a trip to Japan. So Jerry Feldman and I went around Japan on a on a t tour, and. Uh, That was like three weeks or? 72, yeah, mm -hmm. something like a three week mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, trip. It was, it was broad but, but not deep. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but that allowed me to. What time of year was it? So, uh, probably the summer. I don't remember, but Long I time don't. Ago. But mm -hmm. it was some. When it must have been some lovely time of year because mm -hmm. there was no, no <laughs> physical discomfort of the okay. hot summer. Uh -huh. uh, then, uh, in, and then there was some, some on and off trips to Japan. I, I don't remember exactly why during the seventies, but in nineteen seventy nine. I had a an inquiry from. A, um, a, f a person is a, a mutual friend of uh, me and Penny. Penny knew him through IBM Research when she worked there, uh, and I knew him through computer science channels. Uh, Professor y Yamada <coughs> at the University of Tokyo. <coughs> it was an inquiry about whether <coughs> I would <coughs> How about if if he nominated me for a, an exchange award of the <clears throat> Japan Society for the Promotion of Science? And how about if we exchanged houses? So he'd live at my Sanford house. He'd 
work on campus, on sabbatical, and I would be a visiting professor at the University of Tokyo, and that would be, we'd do one quarter that way. Uh, and so I did that. Uh, it was also part of this uh, attempt. Let, let, let's get the timing straight. 79. You, you, you met Penny? 72. 72, and you got married to 75 Se or something like that. 70, what? Yeah. 75. So, okay, so you've been married for four years, and this will be your first extensive time in Japan then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, so we lived outside, a little bit outside of Tokyo, and take, I commuted down to the University of Tokyo. And mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, it was part of my job to, the way this uh, fellowship was set up, it was part of my job to be semi-industrial. That is, I was supposed to go, as a professor, I was supposed to go off and tell industrial people what my ideas were, which I loved. I mean, I loved to talk about expert systems and knowledge-based approaches and so on. So I, I went around, met a, made a lot of industrial contacts, too, at that time, plus some government con contacts through the uh, laboratory, actually a very good laboratory in Scuba called, well, it wasn't in Scuba at the time. It was in Tokyo at the time. In Tsukuba a run-down old building. Huh? Oh, oh, Tsukuba, yeah. the, 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 the city. Um, it was Electrotechnical Lab. Uh -huh. And okay. uh, then it turned out that, so I made some contacts with them. Uh, in fact, uh, I happened to be visiting the Electrotechnical Lab in Tokyo on a day when a uh, typhoon came through. It was the scariest thing. It was the first time in F, maybe the only time I've ever been inside a hurricane. Mm. And uh, parts of the building were flying off. and. Wow. Uh, but anyway, uh, I made contacts there, and it turned out that group, the ETL group, evolved into the group that was responsible for the Japanese fifth generation, fifth generation. project. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this was in 79. 79, but... It, it's, it, it's still, it's sort of uh, not quite born yet. Not quite born yet, but... But, but but you were there, and that's why. And then uh, later on, you you wrote this book about. Yeah, it. well, so I found out more about it later as it began to evolve. Uh, I got an early draft of the plan they were putting together. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, the plan was very ambitious from an AI point of view. That is what they were trying to do for society using AI that they were going to invent over a ten year period. But it was very much of a um, from a software or, or a theory point of view, it was very much like what McCarthy would love, <clears throat> formal logic, prologue. And from a, uh, from a co computational point of view, it, it matched very much the spirit of the times in, uh, in parallel computation. It was a, so half of it was a large investigation in parallel computation. Half of it was using that to do um, highly parallel prologue on Right. They made a big mistake uh, in that project of not paying enough attention to the application space at the beginning, so they didn't really know what they were aiming at until halfway through. Uh, they were flying blind five years mm -hmm. through the project. but And then they tried to catch up and do it all in five years and, and didn't succeed so much. But I wrote a book on it uh, explaining not just their project, but also what where the U.S. trajectory had been mm -hmm. in, in um, thinking about these same issues. And uh, that was basically, the, like I said before, it was the first time that, that AI came into public consciousness. And it was, it was a, um, the way, the way um, one of the Xerox PARC uh, people put it in a review that they did of the book, it was uh, Ed telling AI story by using the Japanese in the plot that's creating a plot around the Japanese okay. to tell AI story, which is not unfair, not yeah. unfair way yeah. of putting it. Well, you need a plot. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That, that's, I, yeah, that's interesting. And, and, and Pamela worked with you on that or book, or uh, was that? No, Pamela. Or, or was uh, that Penny? Who was the co-author? Uh, McCorduck, Pamela yeah. McCorduck. Uh, right. So Pamela uh, McCorduck is, is um, at that time, and still, is, uh, is uh, Professor Joe Traub's wife. Uh, Joe met her in my office mm -hmm. at Stanford yeah. uh, in Polio Hall. Uh, Pamela was my secretary then when I was computer center director and she had 
been that when I was at Berkeley. She was a junior undergraduate, junior. I don't know if I mentioned this in my past interview, but uh, she was an undergraduate junior, and she was uh, the first secretary that Jul not Jerry Feldman, but Julian Feldman and I at Berkeley had I see. on our project. And uh, so Pamela and I were on each other's wavelength for a long time. And uh -huh. uh, she, by that time, she was a, by 82, she was quite a mature writer, had published several novels. and uh, Yeah, I, I've got a couple of her uh, uh, novels that she wrote. Uh, so uh, what um, I did was talk it through with her. Uh, it's part of this um, discipline problem you were talking about before. Mm -hmm. uh, just getting it done by, by working with other people, collaborating, rather than just sitting down and doing it as a loner. And uh, as Pamela and I would sit for hours and talk about this. And so, so do you still visit Japan frequently? Yeah, I, I visit Japan now two times a year. In fact, I'm going to be going on May 20th. Uh, this is, mm -hmm. for those people 50 years mm -hmm. out from now, this is 2007. Mm -hmm. um, I'm consulting for the Air Force Office of Scientific Research that has a, an office in Asia headquartered in Tokyo to sponsor research in Asia. And I'm their consultant on computer science and AI research. So I do two weeks, two times a year. And we used to do it a little more often when Penny's mother was still alive. Mm -hmm. We'd go back there. That was her, that, there. She doesn't have other, uh, other family Her sister and yeah. her younger mm -hmm. brother live in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Okay. Now, um, let's see. Um, I, I got a couple of important oh, ones. I might as well. Don, I want to back yeah. up just a second. Yep. Uh, I want to say two things about the Japanese uh, and my interest in them. Uh, one is a tremendous admiration for their uh, skill intelligence and diligence. It's just really superb. The other thing, even bigger, is my feeling about the, what, this is a very fuzzy thing to say, but I don't mind being fuzzy, uh, the Japanese aesthetic. You can just pick it out anytime you see it, and if it's not there, you know it, and if it's there, you love it. I, it's for me. And the Japanese aesthetic is just wonderful. <clears throat> and so it's a, <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a it's a pleasure to uh, <clears throat> browse through Japanese literature, to look at Japanese designs, to visit things in Japan. It's not that all of Japan is that way. Some of it is just a big bloody mess. Well, but well, you were talking about <clears throat> the, the the new the new iPod <clears throat> competitor, for example. Yeah. It, it had it had elegance in some parts of it, and not in and not in others. That's right. And and uh, it's really hard to. I mean, these are these are really orthogonal t types of expertise, um, uh, but I know what you mean. There's, uh, 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 and that's what that's what drives a lot of our work too. Uh, in, in science, we have this we have the same aspects of taste and uh, stuff. Now, uh, uh, and you can't expect everybody to have. Have, have it all. <laughs> we, that's why the world is so interesting because we get uh, uh, we get uh, uh, lessons from from all the different cultures, and, and we can celebrate that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the about a phase that we haven't said much about, uh, and that is the work that you did in the '80s. Uh, about the blackboard model and and uh, and, and connection with uh, with computer design, uh, yeah. just to to so some reminiscences about that that aspect and how how does that fit in with you know well maybe the fifth generation if if at all or uh, or with the uh, with, with the with the other things we've been talking about the uh, I'm going to start back with. The uh, what AI people call the blackboard model. Those of you out there are going to have to go look it up because uh, mm -hmm. there's no time to tell the story here in detail, a technical story. But uh, you can find the story in a in a 1990 book, roughly speaking, 1990 by uh, Robert Engelmore called Blackboard Systems. It's mm -hmm. a it's a collection. Mm -hmm. Blackboard Systems. Uh, Uh, 
AI people have a variety of, of underlying problem-solving frameworks <clears throat> that they use. <clears throat> they combine a lot of knowledge about the domain, typically, with one of these underlying frameworks. And these frameworks can either be uh, kind of uh, forward-chaining kind of fra framework, uh, or sometimes called generate and test, uh, another, or they could be backward chaining frameworks uh, like um, here's the theorem I want to prove and here's how I have to break it down into pieces in order to prove it. Uh, the, I was doing a, <coughs> excuse me, uh, at DARPA's request, uh, again for those people way out there in the future, DARPA is a U.S. Defense Department research agency that was funding most of, a large portion of computer science research in the, throughout the 60s, 70s, and even up to today. Um, but they um, they asked me to take a look at a at a military problem, a defense problem, not an. Uh, not a problem of attack, but a problem of defense, which had to do with defending against quiet submarines in the ocean, basically finding those submarines. Where were they? And uh, the problem was that the, the, uh, the enemy submarines, in, in, in those days the enemy was the Soviet Union. Soviet submarines, they're, they're pretty good engineers, and they were in, in the Soviet Union, and they were designed their submarines to be very, very quiet, and so did, so did we. But the ocean turns out to be a very noisy place. So the signal-to-noise ratio out there in the ocean, listening with hydrophones to the ocean, was, a very diff was very hard to interpret in terms of where the submarine is. If there was a submarine, where is it? What's it doing? So I, I didn't think I could solve this problem. But you can't say no to DARPA. So we headed into it. Penny, my wife, was the chief engineer of the project. It was not at Stanford because it was classified. It was right off campus in a, a little contract firm off campus. And um, I tried the same uh, hypothesis formation framework that had worked for Dendrol, and it didn't even come close to working on this problem. So fortunately, the Carnegie Mellon people, Raj Reddy and uh, Victor Lesser and uh, Frederick Hazeroth, had come up with a uh, Another framework, which they were using for understanding speech, it was a, the DARPA National Speech Understanding Project called the Blackboard Framework. It never worked for them, but, <clears throat> but I picked it up and adapted it for our project, and it worked just absolutely brilliantly. And it allowed an arbitrary combination of top-down reasoning and bottom-up reasoning from data to be merged at different levels, which to use terminology we were earlier talking about, are really levels of abstraction in the problem. And there would be little, there would be experts in the world who were experts on how to go from this level to that level, but didn't know anything about the other level. So this is a world composed of a lot of experts. In, in the program we call them knowledge sources. And um, the knowledge sources, each knowledge source would have a kind of a human name for their body of expertise, like a uh, there were people in the speech world who knew about phonemes, and there were other people who knew about pragmatics, and there were other people who knew about semantics, and there were lexicographers and grammarians, and these were all individual experts. But what we did was put together, we're using this so-called Blackboard framework, a collaboration framework where they could all collaborate on a common solution which was being built on, of all things, a place called the Blackboard, which was a commonly available data structure with all the reasons why each knowledge source gave for its evidence for why something was valid at a certain level of abstraction. Is it similar to what people use on video conferences now where they have the software that people are, are adding to, uh, a, I guess it's a whiteboard now, but they have, uh, uh, but, but it's sort of, uh, a display that everybody, uh, all participants are, yeah. are, are, are viewing well, and, and uh, erasing on. And that's correct. And the only, the difference mm -hmm. there would be in the what you're talking about, it's all people, not programs. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we, we nailed it down a little less fuzzy than 
we, we, had, we were a little bit, bit, bit more structured and analytic than you would find in these video mm -hmm. conferences. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was a similar idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we actually produced a program that in its test version, proto -ver prototype version, uh, no, I'm sorry, scratch that. Its prototype version was so promising that they are, DARPA continued it for another two years, in, and they they took they made the prototype version into a a solidly running version that was tested by MITRE Corporation against tested against the behavior of humans doing the same thing on the coastal stations of the West Coast, and um, the program did better than people. Doesn't mean anything to the Navy. The Navy just couldn't cope with it, and they never installed it, but. Uh, but, but it did the job. So then we used it, but it was classified. So what can you, what can you rescue from a classified, military classified situation? Well, the only thing the government cared about was the classification of the frequencies of noises being made on Soviet submarines. They didn't care about the Blackboard framework. That was, that was computer science. So we rescued that in two ways. <coughs> One was a, some papers that were written uh, in AI magazine, Penny wrote some two really uh, much referenced papers, uh, and we did a kind of hypothetical how to find pandas in eucalyptus trees. Uh, very, very difficult to find a panda in a eucalyptus tree. Uh, <laughs> I see, not a submarine. <laughs> what? Okay. And uh, the other thing was we did an, another. Um, we started another big application, which was in the non-classified area. Isn't which it was supposed to be koala bears? I'm just <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry, not pandas. Koala bears. You're right. Koala bears and eucalyptus trees, not pandas. <clears throat> right. How to find a koala in a eucalyptus tree, which arose in a trip I took in Australia, and the forest ranger was trying to point out the koala to me, and I couldn't see the koala. <laughs> it was just like a Soviet submarine in the ocean. Uh, well. Then we did a very complicated application, which was one that hadn't been done before. It had been done with massive amounts of computation, but the world didn't have that much computation, and you needed a kind of heuristic method for doing it, knowledge-based method, and that was uh, X-ray crystallography, interpreting the uh, electron density of crystallized proteins in, in terms of what atoms were attached to what atoms in what geometric structure in this crystal. And you needed not only knowledge about the physics of electron density, which was, which was one blackboard plane, but we also had a chemistry blackboard plane because you needed knowledge of chemistry as well as, as, as that. So it was the first time that there were uh, what we called intersecting blackboard planes. And it was also another very su successful application. Uh, so then, now we're, time-wise, we're up in the late 70s, early 80s, and, and now the, um, the, the zeitgeist was calling for working on parallel computing. There were, uh, <coughs> Gordon Bell had started a, a company <coughs> in parallel, uh, with parallel processors, and I had talked to Gordon quite a lot about how to structure them. Uh, there were... Uh, another one that Ben Wegbright was heading out here in um, in Silicon Valley, uh, which combined with a third one, I think, to make a company called Stardent. Anyway, there was quite a a, a movement toward oh, on thinking machines. Are and, these are you talking about general purpose parallel machines? Yeah, or? general purpose parallel machines. But so, Gordon Bauer and and huh? I mean oh, okay, but 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 the psychologists are no 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 Gordon no, Bell Gordon Bell excuse me yeah. okay. I, no, not Gordon I, Bell. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Gordon Bell had left deck and yeah. was started. Oh, uh, yes, of course. And he went to NSF at about this time, wasn't he? Uh, uh, at some, yeah, he did and, at some point, yeah. but then he started a company. And, and promoting in, parallel. Company. In parallel machines. Okay. Right, okay. So uh, when I looked at that, I said, mm, maybe we can, uh, to do AI problems, the parallel, black, the, the Blackboard framework was ideal because the activities of the of the different segments of computation could be 
not totally but largely parallelized by these different knowledge sources working on different pieces of the problem, communicating, either communicating to a common blackboard or distributing the blackboard to all processors all the time, an updated blackboard. And so we started down that track. DARPA liked that idea. We, we um, borrowed a uh, computer designer from DEC, Bruce DeLaghi, and we had Harold Brown, our, uh, one of our really good people, a mathematician working on the problems too, and some graduate students. And we worked on the problem at the, s we were simulating parallel machines. The reason being that, that I had no interest in building anything. In fact, I didn't even believe in building anything. I believe you ought to test out the ideas before you built it. Building is expensive, and if you got the wrong thing at the end, you'd be very unhappy. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that in that particular game, namely the game of architecture of machines, if you're a digital systems lab, what do we call them? CSL persons, computer systems lab person in our department or similar departments, you don't have any credibility at all if you do it at the software level. If it's not at the hardware level, it doesn't exist. So it was very, almost impossible to communicate ideas to these people. First of all, they weren't interested in, in AI things anyway. Second of all, it turned out that there was, with Moore's Law operating, there was plenty of power anyway for the AI methods to, to work on ordinary machines. You didn't really need parallel machines. So it all, it was an extremely interesting endeavor, but it didn't really come to anything then. But that, but now we're running out of gas on Moore's Law. And now you're finding Intel and AMD are putting, it used to be two cores on a chip, now it's four, it's going to be eight, they're talking about 16. That was exactly the, that was exactly the range of multiprocessor activity that we were doing then. It wasn't, we weren't doing thinking machines type stuff with a thousand or ten thousand processors, mm -hmm. doing, each doing little things. We were, we were using a few processors doing big things, mm -hmm. knowledge sources for a blackboard. And so uh, I'm getting the feeling that we have to resurrect some of those papers, like doing a, a volume of selected papers from that era to resurrect those ideas. Long story. Right. No, that's that, good. another case where something happens before its time, and it and it, uh, but uh, it 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 uh, uh, doesn't mean that it's that it has to die, you know, uh, uh, forever. And and uh, uh, very few of the things that have ever been discovered about computers uh, turn out to be never useful. They're always dominated by something else. That there's that uh, once. Small change in, in hardware capability uh, can mean that all of a sudden something is is um, much more much better than th than the other thing which would, which used to seem to be better. Right. Now let's see. Um, I, I guess I should ask something about the experiences of starting up companies because that's a big thing. Although that's not one of my personal interests. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm doing it only because I know there are people watching who are interested in <laughs> more interested in in the um, uh, I mean, it's important for the world to, to you know, people to make a living and, and all that. And I, I, so, but I have to admit my own bias is, is less in that in that direction. But still, uh, that's my own problem. I, so, so I, I, uh, I know that there's uh, Intelligenetics, the Technology, uh, Intellicorp, or was it uh, different? I don't. Maybe more companies and. Uh, and I, you mentioned Sperry Rand, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that where you serve on the board. But I'm more interested in the startups. I yeah, think yeah. Uh, uh, your, your some of the stories associated with that, and and uh, uh, you know how you got the idea to do it to uh, to come during the night or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, let me. That, so that also is a, a package of stories. Let right. me. Let me start by saying that um, that there were really uh, two inspirations for starting companies. One was a kind of a general inspiration and the other was quite specific. The general inspiration was wanting to get your ideas out there uh, and along the way uh, making some money on these companies uh, just like some of us do consulting and 
Right. It was that sort of thing. Uh, I, and, no, I, I understand. I had and not only for yourself, but also for involving no, a lot you, of the people you, you in your You see life. that the world, no, nobody's, nobody's rising to the occasion, and the world needs, needs something. And, yeah. I, and I had the similar thing you know, with, uh, with, with fonts and so, and, 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 and so on. Uh, I didn't mean to. No, no. To, so I'm, I'm, let me head down the yeah. story. So then the specific inspiration was that, that there's a Stanford culture that it, it's an order of magnitude stronger today than it was at that time, but at that time it was still very strong, in 1979. Of, it sort of comes out of the Hewlett Packard mm -hmm. life story mm -hmm. of people starting companies. It, it was Varian, the Varian brothers being professors at Stanford started Varian and uh, Hewlett and Packard earlier than that, and there were several stories, even smaller stories, Elliot Leventhal starting Leventhal Medical Electronics and maybe a dozen other companies. But right about 79, there were a, a group of companies that were being, that were being born uh, in connection with the emerging biotechnology in, out of the medical school. In fact, so many companies were being born that um, Don Kennedy, who was president at the time, started to worry, started to worry about whether he had to uh, have special regulations at Stanford to regulate conflict of interest between mm -hmm. faculty and the companies. Mm -hmm. That's that's how many companies there were. So, um, when did Jurassic? Oh, Jurassic's uh, work was never part. Of Jurassic came here to Stanford as uh, as a joint appointment, that is a 50% appointment in chemistry, 50% doing his company, which was Syntex. Already, yeah. And, and um, right. it was early on that Stanford and Jurassi got together on the great idea to put Syntex in the industrial park, rather than in Mexico City or wherever it had mm -hmm. been born. Okay, so uh, in, that, in that atmosphere, in that environment, we saw two things unfolding. One was that there was a very large demand for a piece of software we had produced in the heuristic programming project, which was the software generalization of uh, the Mycin medical diagnosis expert system called eMycin. Very large demand for that, and and uh, and, a, and and a smaller but very but substantial demand for a a Blackboard framework piece of software that we had developed called AGE, A-G-E, which modestly stood for attempt to generalize. We were attempting to generalize what we had done in the sonar and in the crystallography examples. Uh, so that was one example, that was one instance where there was a lot of what you might call user demand for, for this stuff. Companies were after us, we were shipping out literally hundreds of copies of the software and documentation. <clears throat> Seemed like a company could do that better than, <clears throat> than a laboratory. The second <clears throat> place where we had um, a lot of demand was uh, users coming in over the ARPANET. Maybe it, by that time it, they were coming in on the NSFNet portion of, of the network, but they were coming in to use the SumX machine to do uh, sequence manipulation in the unfolding, emerging sequence databases that were being built at the time. Mm -hmm. um, it looked like that was also the basis for another company because a company could do that. I mean, why should we waste our, our PDP-10 resources serving the nation for this when they could be buying it from a, a company could run it and, and they, could, they could buy it from that company. And uh, what, was it university researchers, or were, were or were these were these other companies buying the buying the time? Oh, oh, the, a combination of both. Mm -hmm. a combination of both. And uh, it, when, when you say at the time, I, I mean, are these companies? Are, are, I'd like to sort of put dates on them. So, yeah. So, so dates so, would so, be. So which which were first? What was first, second, third, uh, and approximately when? You know, or, or did they all start out at the same time, or? Oh, the, uh, yeah, okay, great. I'm going to put yep. dates on it. Yep. So, in, um, in uh, I'll, I'll have to um, uh, edit this when the transcript comes out and right. get the exact dates, but uh, 
in 19... In 1980, uh, we decided to move forward. Well, we were in conversation about moving forward on both fronts, the biology front and the expert system software front in two separate companies in 1980. Mm -hmm. the, it was easier to get the biology one moving first because there were, the only people involved were myself, the two biologists, and Peter Friedland. We got a f another person involved, a graduate student in, in uh, the Graduate School of Business who, who was taking a course on how to write business plans. And so we got the faculty member to target him at us, and he wrote our business plan. And, and uh, we sold it to a, a venture capitalist who I happen to know because uh, they were friends of Ed Fredkin. Mm -hmm. We were talking about Fredkin before. Friends mm -hmm. of Ed Fredkin, and Fredkin had gotten money from them to start a... Uh, you remember Perk, the computer company? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I invested. Yeah, in, I invested in, in Perk, in, and, in three and so did Raj, and so did Herb Simon, and yeah. you now. And anyway, mm -hmm. uh, Fredkin uh, knew these people, and therefore I got to know them. And we got IntelliGenetics up and running in um, 19, roughly speaking, late 1980, selling sequence analysis software on a deck machine that was networked in some way, and I've, I'm not sure how. Maybe it was via the timeshare network, mm -hmm. something else at that time. The, the uh, other company was called Technology. And uh, as you can see the difference in the names, Intelligenetics points to biology, right. and Technology points to technology and knowledge-based systems. And there it was not four people or two people, it was 20 people, mm -hmm. because my view of, of that was that everyone who had helped us get to this point needed to be in some sense rewarded by being a participant in this new enterprise. So I just made a list of all the people who helped us, who contributed something, like the graduate student who did Emison and Tom Rinfleisch who helped us with Sumex and Bruce Buchanan who was uh, at that point, Philosophy. Uh, so, like associate yeah. director of the laboratory, and Bob Engelmore, and for Blackboard Systems, and Penny, and my wife, and, and s people like that who had contributed. Uh, plus, plus, I got in um, two other people. One, not for, I mean, not from Stanford. One, Randy Davis from MIT, who had mm -hmm. contributed a little bit earlier, but had left. And the other was a very good articulator of uh, the ideas from Rand Corporation. Uh, a guy by the name of Frederick Hayes Roth. Yeah, and, and Denny Brown was involved with, the, with technology too? Denny? Denny, yeah, or no? Um, okay. I, I don't I, think so. I don't think he was. I'm not sure of that, but I don't think he was because uh, I don't think he was a member of the Knowledge Systems Lab, uh, of, of the yeah. Heuristic Programming Project, mm -hmm. uh, which later turned into the Knowledge Systems Lab. Mm -hmm. Now, get, starting a company with 20 people is it's bizarre, and I didn't know it at the time. Uh, it's only later when, when people in the entrepreneurial world who know about these things basically said, are you crazy? You can't do that. You have to have a group of people who think in common, act fast. That's the, the way the culture works. Um, but I never thought that 20 people would be a hard, a hard thing to do. Uh, turned out, it's like herding cats, oh, okay. and and um, and it was a lot more difficult than we thought. Uh, well, it's uh, also a big responsibility. It was. I mean, you're you're affecting the, their lives so you know so directly. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, you. Um, it's not just like being a teacher. Well, we, we had thought, I had thought that we would get a, a professional businessman to run the thing, that professional businessman would get venture capital, and then using the venture capital, they would hire good people. Instead, what happened was a significant chunk of our own people gravitated over there because the work was exciting, it was a new thing, and it was paying a lot more than we were paying. So. We, in a way, we kind of decimated our, our laboratory by doing this. Anyway, long, long and short story is they spent a lot of money. 
they um, they had a uh, they being the the professional businessman that we hired uh, tried to negotiate a uh, intellectual property agreement with Stanford for the rights to use the uh, eMice and software that had been developed at Stanford. Uh, Stanford at the time was they were very much of a novice in the area of dealing with small companies. They mm -hmm. they still are difficult, I hear, but but they were impossible at that time. So the guy just said, okay, technology will develop its own, forget eMice. And, and they spent a lot of money doing that. And by the time they finished doing that, uh, Osborne had a $1,000 version of that software, out, or maybe a $100 version of that software out and running on the early PCs. And mm -hmm. their $5,000 version wasn't going to sell. And so it didn't work out so well for that company. And then eventually it got sold. It still, uh, and then it, it resurrected itself it, it's still in business, it's still in Palo Alto, it still employs a couple dozen people doing uh, military applications mostly. Uh, Intelligenetics couldn't get a grip on the biology software market because those people at the University of Wisconsin I was telling you about before basically were offering the same thing for free and PCs were coming into play so you didn't need you didn't need one end of a PDB-10. You could buy your own PC for two thousand dollars and run the University of Wisconsin software for nothing, and I see. so yeah. it didn't. So it changed its name from Intelligenetics to IntelliCorp, uh -huh. and started to sell a version of some software it had licensed from Stanford that we had done in our laboratory, which was one of the first uh, languages that incorporated uh, object-oriented programming with inference methods. It was called Key, Knowledge Engineering Environment, developed by uh, Peter Friedland and Mark Steffick and a few other people did, in our lab. Did, did this run on <coughs> on PCs or workstations? I mean, at, in those days, there was there, there was quite a difference between yeah. a, a personal computer and a workstation. What? Uh, it um, Intelligenetics was close. This was before it became IntelliCorp. Mm -hmm. As Intelligenetics, it was close to being Sun's first customer. I don't know if it was Sun's first customer, but okay. because I knew of the emergence of the Sun workstation at yeah. Stanford, and I knew what power you could have for a few thousand bucks in that workstation, yeah. I immediately oriented the company, the, the business guys, to go make a deal. And that was when Vinod Kosla was uh, president of Sun, not... Uh, um, oh, it was a very, the, the very earliest president. Uh, yeah. when, and Sun was still stumbling around. In fact, they weren't really such a good vendor because they were, their machines weren't that reliable at that time. But we were a very early customer. And then IntelliCorp, uh, uh, did, I think they pursued the same strategies to offer it on workstations. But by that time, the Lisp machines were out. Mm -hmm. And this stuff ran really well on mm -hmm. Lisp machines. Mm -hmm. So they were selling them on yeah. Lisp machines. They were selling them on uh, the Sperry version of the Lisp machine, the TI version of the Lisp machine. They were selling them on the portable versions of the Lisp machine, the desktop versions of the Lisp machine, whatever they were called, micro something mm -hmm. or other. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had lots and lots of applications, the very uh, sophisticated applications that they were doing. They too never got business traction and lasted right through the dot-com bust until during the dot-com bust they went bust. So they lasted mm -hmm. Uh, roughly, roughly speaking, 20 years. Intelli Intelligenetics and Intel oh, Intelligenetics got spun off and was sold to uh, Standard Oil Research, that, who wanted to get into um, molecular biology applications. Mm -hmm. uh, IntelliCorp lasted about 20 years. Technology is still in existence. They're all in the spec in the space called the Living Dead, where they're they're not big like Google or Yahoo or eBay. And they're not, they don't go out of business right away. They just provide enough business to keep their employees employed. Mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of them in Silicon, lots of these companies in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Then there was a third company, which I started jointly with um, a professor in the um, civil engineering department at Stanford. Doing, uh, so one of IntelliCorp's... Who was that? Um, I'll put it into okay. the transcript. Okay. Ray Levin. Ray Levitt. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I was thinking the civil engineering have some kind of a, a blackboard model uh, that they use for scheduling jobs. I mean, you know, the, the electricians put up their, 
their uh, data and you know and, could, and, and the other contractors yeah that too. could be That's very uh, that could be the case because one mm -hmm. of our PhD students ended up running their big laboratory over there John Kuntz uh -huh. um, uh, and so it could it could that could be the, uh, I, I just don't know me, that but excuse me for interrupting but anyway uh, one of the customers of IntelliCorp in Europe in Finland was using key to do engineering design of big, I mean gigantic boiler systems for huge factories. Mm -hmm. it, was one, it was one of the earliest applications of, maybe the earliest application of AI to engineering design. And it looked like it should be just a really great AI application area where you could sell it for a lot of money into companies that would make a lot of, save a lot of money using this software. Mm -hmm. And it was in Lisp, and it was, run, it was programmed in Key, which ran in Lisp, ran on workstations. We started a company called... When you say called, Key, I, I, I'm not familiar with that. You spell key it? Key is Knowledge Engineering Environment, K-E-E. K-E-E, -E. okay. It was, a, it was an object-oriented system on top of Lisp that also incorporated inference software in its methods. K-E-E, okay. K-E-E. -E. It was actually designed, believe it or not, it was, des it was, it was based on a, some software at Stanford, but redesigned by Richard Fikes, who was vice president for research of IntelliCorp. Okay. Uh, so it's one of Richard's great contributions, mm -hmm. was key. Um, that company, Design, <coughs> excuse me, Design Power Incorporated, <coughs> was um, the, the two Finnish guys who had developed the software came to the United States and with permission from their company, I don't know exactly, I can't remember the grounds for, for using the intellectual property from their company, but they plus um, uh, one person from Silicon Valley kind of launched this company. I was one of the founders, Ray Levitt was one of the founders, uh, and it had a very difficult time uh, selling into the uh, the the the, the so sales that we thought would be so obvious just weren't. The 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 companies were there was a tremendous amount of inertia in the big engineering companies to adopt this. Um, eventually, uh, so the company kind of went partially bankrupt after its first round of venture capital. Uh, it couldn't get another round of venture capital because there was uh, some difficulty with between there was some difficulty with Finnish investors that were in this company. They, they didn't quite understand the ground rules of Silicon Valley and they, they basically screwed up. And so the original company had to reconstitute itself. But in the end, they did uh, survive long enough to be bought by another software company about a month ago mm. in 2007. Mm. So um, in, in the end, they, their ideas still survive and the software still s mm -hmm. survives, but not, not in a big way. Well, now, um, oh, and one other thing, yeah. Don, I just want to mention that during the dot-com boom, mm -hmm. I was approached by several people who wanted to use expert systems in their, whatever their categories were, in that they were trying to exploit web-based something or other, right. and uh, would I be a, a helper, a guru, a, an early investor, etc. Mm -hmm. And I did some of those, and they, some of them turned out to be extremely good, mm -hmm. like one of them merged with a company which merged with another company which is now shopping.com and it was uh -huh. expert systems for the for the shopper uh-huh okay well that's good segue and unless you have something else you want to say about company uh i mean i wanted to uh focus on the on expert systems uh i mean as it relates to interacts with other streams of ai and and uh, these are. I know that Nils is going to be interviewing you about uh, about this, but I wanted to bring it out uh, sure. too. So I mean, there, uh, artificial intelligence is a huge subject, and uh, and it doesn't only have needs and scruffies. I mean, it has. It also. Uh, so I'm thinking, for example, of the strains, you know, like Stuart Russell, uh, uh, Berkeley, and Daphne uh, uh, work, and and you know, I was looking at the. There's, there were there are a couple of journals uh, in the library. Um, there's one journal called Heuristics uh, and another one ca called Heuristic Methods or something, Heuristic Science. I don't know. There's, there are two journals that start out with, with, with heuristics in the title. 
and, and so I was browsing through them the other day as I was in the stacks, and I know, and I, and I, and, you know, but I looked in the uh, issues from two years ago or something, and it would say, and and uh, uh, it what? The, uh, no, I'm sorry. There's a journal called Expert Systems, yeah. right? Uh, um, it, uh, and, and expert, yeah. I'm sorry. Expert yeah. systems and expert systems with applications yes. or something like that. That's right. what I'm thinking. Not here. Um, and but I looked inside and and uh, you know and 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 when I, you know a certain percentage of the papers were about expert systems, but others were about fuzzy logic, uh, some uh, or or genetic algorithms. So maybe this is all you know all of a piece or or. or, or um, um, uh, but but there's you know all these many currents going on. There's there are neural nets uh, uh, articles in there. there um, I know the Japanese uh, uh, use fuzzy logic for everything. I don't yeah. know why uh, because I never under, you know understood it. But so so we've got you know Stuart Russell's uh, approaches to um, uh, well what, what we call it automatic learning. For machine learning, and then, you know, there, Daphne, the, you know, Bayesian nets. There's there's fuzzy systems. There's work, you know, there's Doug Lennett's uh, 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 gathering of, of knowledge bases and all these things. So, <laughs> can you in 25 words or less, or yeah. you know, just to try to sort how, it all out? How, how do you yeah. how, how okay. do you view this map? Um, right. Very 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 good question. Uh, it really won't, I'm going to do it, but it won't be 25 words or less, it might be 250 <laughs> words or less. No, no, I don't want, to, I don't want it to be that small, short, but, but, I, 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 uh, but anyway. I, I, I'd like a guide okay. to the perplexed. So, yeah. so once, once upon a time, there was, um, uh, to use words I just got right out of uh, Lee Smolin's book on <laughs> physics, uh, there used to be exact knowledge in in our expert systems. That is, when we first started, we started with uh, atoms, carbon atoms, oxygen atoms, valences, uh, uh, chemical graphs connecting these things, uh, rules for breaking for breaking uh, bonds. Mm -hmm. Either the bond broke or it didn't break. And, and, there was yeah. a, and these were if-then rules for representing this knowledge. And we had a lot of that knowledge. And none of it was fuzzy. None of it was probabilistic, probabilistic, or in any way, in any way probabilistic. Then, uh, mice and it had to be. Then we came in. Yeah. We stumbled into. Uh, so Ted Shortliff started working on mice and, and then it turned out that doctors wanted to re represent mm. their knowledge with a little bit of fuzziness. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, they were using several English language words that covered the space, uh, like likely. Mm -hmm or unlikely, or a couple other variants of that in the middle. Mm -hmm. I forget the details, but <clears throat> there were common words in medicine. But there were only like five, mm -hmm. five of those. And Ted, Ted expanded that to be ten categories, not five. He could have probably gotten away with five, but he, he, he did ten. And set up a little ad hoc calculus to combine those numbers into um, what he called a confidence factor. <clears throat> Do a little bit of reasoning in the background in the background with this confidence factor. Um, now, the, that kind of ad hoc. Oh, we used it incidentally on the sonar uh, thing. Perfect. I mean, just wonderful. It just worked perfectly. We, so, sonar. Uh, just remember that sonar example of finding submarines in the ocean. Oh yeah. We used that. The classified. Uh, Penny and I just used. Okay. Uh, short lift scheme mm -hmm. right out of the box and it was great um, let me tell you the next step and then go back a step mm -hmm. uh, the next step was that got a lot of people unhappy if you're dealing with uh, something where the words were likely or unlikely or that my god we mathematicians have invented a whole calculus for that and why are you being ad hoc about it? Why all this ad hocery when you could use mathematics? Frankly, that was almost exactly the kind of words that you would hear. Mm -hmm. And to which the answer was, hey folks, you don't bring a big cannon to bear on something where you don't need it. Mm -hmm. 
where a little pop gun would do. Uh, so let me go back now and <clears throat> give you <clears throat> an example <clears throat> from, um, from Jurassic. And here's one of the world's great minds, one of the world's great mass spectrometrists. We're showing him, we're, we're extracting knowledge from Carl about some mass spectrum. <clears throat> mass spectrum has a top, molecular fragment weights along the x-axis and it has relative abundance of fragments at that weight on the y-axis. And we were setting up rules for the fragmentation of certain molecules that were showing itself that way, representing itself that way. And we said, well, Carl, what are you going to do with these uh, y-axis points? Uh, he said, well, first of all, let's ignore them. In other words, he was just, it was zero, one. Either the fragment was there or it's not. Okay. And we said, wait a second, you're not going to, these are lots of peaks, you're not going to ignore the heights of the peaks, are you really? He said, okay, I, I'll tell you what. We'll just call them high, medium, and low. Okay. So all that the chemists needed was either it's there or it's not there, or else the most they wanted to use was high, medium, and three values. So we went to go back to the thing we were saying, well, you don't really need. <clears throat> you can set up a, <clears throat> a very simple logic, an ad hoc logic, to deal with this. Along comes Latvizada, and he says, I'll put in some systematic logic into that. It wasn't exactly what uh, the Bayesian logic that's being used now. It was a, more like a Latvizada. It was less ad hoc than ours, but it was still pretty ad hoc. The Japanese got to love that. They got to love the idea that there was a little calculus involved, a little mathematical calculation involved in doing that. So uh, the first application that was done in Japan was, uh, I helped to advise them, it was done in uh, Hitachi System Development Lab, and it was uh, to control, an expert system to control the braking of subway trains in Sendai. And you didn't want the subway train to come to a sharp stop, which would jerk all the passengers, and there was expertise in the conductor, and the, the conductor would use his expertise to know how to apply the brakes. Well, he needed a little bit of fuzziness there to accommodate certain situations. So they, that, and it, that, it got generalized, I mean, not generalized, but it got used all over the place from subways all the way down to fuzzy rice cookers. But these were little expert systems with 20 rules, 50 rules, but with a little uh, uh, ad hoc, almost ad hoc calculus. Well, then came a couple students of ours, um, uh, David Heckerman, Eric Horvitz. Remember them? Uh, David won the uh, uh, ACM thesis award the year that his thesis was done. Both of them work at Microsoft Research now. Uh, and they were working with Ron Howard in the industrial engineering department on a more systematic uh, decision, what shall I call it, decision-making algorithm structure. And that turned into uh, what are called belief nets okay. and these Bayesian analyses. So then, then it became a really sort of a hot topic. Then you didn't have five people working on it. Then all of a sudden, you had 500 people, or 50 people at least in the field, working on those kind of issues. And that became its own little field. Mm -hmm. And any field like that becomes self-propagating. And it doesn't matter if Ed Feigenbaum keeps standing up and saying, you guys don't need that armada. There is no reason for coming out with a number like, 0. 0.69108. It doesn't make any sense at all. And the, these problem-solving activities are more or less qualitative. Yes. Uh, in the way mm -hmm. polio would have would have thought about it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. That has no effect on people. They they. It's what I call physics envy. Before they absolutely <laughs> have to have it. Okay. I look back at the paper that Wigner wrote, which was the paper in 1961 or two on the unreasonable application of mathematics yeah. to the physical well, unreasonable sciences. Unreasonable effectiveness. Huh? Unreasonable effectiveness. Yeah, so. effectiveness. And say, well, just, you know, even for physics it was unreasonable. Why do you mm -hmm. need it for this stuff? And yet that doesn't have any impact. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, so when you read Stuart Russell's book uh, with Norvig, for example, on what he calls uh, uh, artificial intelligence, a modern introduction, what, by what, what he means by modern is, I'm going to get rid of all that scruffy stuff and I'm going to put all the neat stuff in. Okay. And then you get Nils saying, like he did at the uh, AI Lab retreat last two weeks ago, he was saying, I used to be one of the neats, and I wrote a book with Genezeras on it, and now I'm moving in the other direction. I'm a scruffy now. 
Well, I don't think you have to be either or, do you? <laughs> I mean, can't you appreciate uh, some of the talents of Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> I think so. And I think that's the way it's going to end up. Yeah. Is that, uh, <clears throat> yeah. um, you know, right. I, uh, no, I, I, of course, I, I, I work with font design, and it's a similar thing, uh, where I, uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at the people who are uh, uh, getting drawings from a great designer, they will measure everything with uh, with with a micrometer to see exactly where where, the, where where his ink stroke went. But if you have the designer in your office with you, the, you know when Herman Saab came to visit me, you know, uh, oh, this looks like about one to four, you know, let's you know, and then and then and you and you just do, you know, uh, so uh, uh, these these decimal points was it was not. Uh, the question where, is, where why the burn up was, a lot of graduate student time and faculty members' but, time and but pages I think, in the journal? No, but 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 I, I think the, the fuzzy lo logic people would say, well, but we want, but we really aren't concerned about the numbers so much as the as the uh, axioms that 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 these that these things satisfy, and then they can they can then get a higher level view of, of, of it when, once they know that th there are some algebraic operations that they can do, and then they can use that. As a, as a guide to as a guide to taking the next step. So so it's, uh, it's that's why I'm saying we we don't really necessarily have to. Uh, I mean, so, some people might might uh, you know wear their neat hat one day and the scrubby hat. Sometimes they'll, they'll they might be, be uh, uh, both in the same body. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Let me tell you one more thing. The, the Doug Lennett work doesn't fit into this paradigm at all. Uh, Doug's yeah. Doug's work is orthogonal. Uh -huh. Doug's work is uh, whether or not you use any numbers at all to characterize these relationships. Right. Doug's work is to to prove that huge amounts of knowledge will explain or will replicate common sense reasoning, and that uh, there is nothing to common sense reasoning but a huge amount of knowledge. Okay. And huge for him, you know. It, right now, it's five million things, but and maybe it needs to be five hundred million things. Is, but, how does common sense affect versus experts? I mean, experts is uncommon sense. Yeah, um, exactly. An expert. So, uh, uh, Herb Simon did a uh, series of studies after he 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 said he was influenced by the uh, expert system work to go look at what it takes. What's an expert? What makes an ex a human expert at something? Mm -hmm. And his pa a paper with uh, Bill Chase. For, for uh, at least in the case of chess playing uh, masters, indicated that uh, the chess masters knew about 70,000 things, plus or minus 20,000 things, of uh, specific chess lore more than the amateurs knew. And that it takes about 10 years to acquire these 70,000 things. And so th we're not, that's not the 7 million or 70 million or 700 million things that Doug is after. Mm -hmm. It's a narrow thing. I don't know if I told you that story about the pulmonary function diagnostic guy. We worked with a guy when E. Meissen was born. The three, Penny and I decided we are going to test out whether it's indeed the case that you could shove a new domain into E. Meissen quickly. So I had a relationship going with Pacific Medical Center up in San Francisco, and I I knew a guy up there who was a pulmonary physiologist who did lung disease diagnosis from a machine called a spirometer. It's a machine that you, you breathe in and out of. I don't know if you've ever used it. You go, and then the curves of your breathing show up, and uh, your intake and your outflow of air. And from that, they diagnose the condition of your breathing apparatus. And uh, uh, we, we worked with him for three weeks from t the first hundred cases that he showed us from his files, mm -hmm. got a good set of rules, polished them with test cases from another hundred cases that he had. By the end of 200 cases, we were at the point of diminishing returns. We, we had it. We nailed it. And we nailed it with 400 rules. And this guy looked at the, and he said, is that all it is? Is that what I know? 400 things? <laughs> and we said, yeah, Bob, it looks like it. <laughs> And mm -hmm. he gave up doing that for five years. He went mm -hmm. and did something else. Cause he couldn't stand the idea that, mm -hmm. that what he was doing was captured by 500, 400 rules. Mm -hmm. Well, for, it might be 70,000, but 
Common sense is way, way more than that. Common sense means almost everything you know. I see. Okay. And what about the... Um, oh, I'm thinking about uh, Rod Brooks. Uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, the uh, physical-based uh, uh, intelligence or whatever, yeah. the way the, the way th things, uh, l l um, you know, they, they just are little motors that are I interacting b by evolution uh, in, 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 in ways that aren't understandable by logic. Um, yeah. So uh, it turns out Rod himself doesn't believe that anymore. Mm -hmm. But as it's not because he changed his mind so much, it's just that it was... It was obvious that what he was proposing wasn't the whole story, and he's just come to encompass more of the whole story. The uh, I used, it's called the uh, uh, it's the view that the world is its own best representation. So don't try to represent the world. I, uh, embodied or something was is one of the buzzwords that I, that I heard at MIT. Uh, and, 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 I don't know and, that. Okay, I'm not sure about that buzzword, but. Yeah. But the, the, the idea is don't try to capture the details of the world like McCarthy would do in formulae, but instead just respond to the details of the world in whatever is a useful way to respond to it. So if you're an insect and it's a mm -hmm. pebble, responding to it might be to lift up your leg mm -hmm. to touch the pebble and then move on. Mm -hmm. Well, all of us... So my interest in AI is conceptual reasoning. So I, in fact, my goal, I kind of called it when I, when I wrote the article for JACM uh, a few years ago, 2002, I think, uh, trying to redefine Turing's test. Uh, I call this goal Einstein in a box. And I really meant it. I really meant that I wanted to replicate the mental qualities of an Einstein in terms of conceptual understanding, reasoning, deep reasoning, insightful reasoning. And and I said to Rod, what you're doing is great for insects. You know, you might make the world's best insect, but so what? So it's the world's best insect. Now, that's not really fair, because years before, eminent psychologists thought exactly the way Rod was thinking, uh, like Skinner's uh, stimulus response, is exactly the way Rod would describe what his leg on his robot was doing. It mm -hmm. felt this pebble, and it responded by lifting up the leg. And, mm -hmm. Skinner, you know, was famous. He won all kinds of awards for believing that you could frame human thinking that way. Mm -hmm. And and his view was, uh, there, there's like a big fight between uh, Skinner and and uh, others. Um, I can't remember the name of the psychologist, but he was um, responsible for a brand of psychology called Mental Maps. Um, and there was a big fight in the 1930s between Skinner and the mental maps people. And the mental maps people won. That is, we do have a representation of the world in our head. Mm -hmm. It is a symbolic representation. Mm -hmm. Mice have it, not mm -hmm. just humans. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you can't blame Rod. I mean, that's a, a viewpoint which has a distinguished well, it background. Well, it still might contribute to common sense. <laughs> you mean stimulus response? Yeah. Yeah, sure. You see something and you just fire off on it. Yeah. Right. Now. Um, okay. Oops, we got five minutes. Um, I want, to, if, if necessary, we can go to another tape. But uh, I, I think a uh, uh, nice way to, to sort of let's look now vectors to the future. And and if you have some last words of advice to uh, to people, you know that. So so uh, I, I I hate if somebody asks me to predict what the future is going to be. But if you but uh, uh, so I'm giving you a choice of, 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 of two questions here, e either to say what you think is it, uh, it is going to happen after today, uh, or if or uh, and or you can also say you know uh, uh, besides everything else I've I, I've been mentioning what 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 do I what do I want to tell you uh, people of the year 2050? So. Yeah. <laughs> Let me uh, address your, the, let me say the answer to your question in, at, at two levels. The level of the uh, person who might be watching this 
a young person, maybe an uh, undergraduate or even a graduate student who has a full career ahead of her or him, and then the person who's watching this thing out 50 or 100 years from now. Uh, to the uh, person watching it, uh, to the younger person who's looking for for career tracks, I would predict, I, I, I would advise actually, be, which is another way of saying I would predict that it's a that it's a good thing to do. To um, first of all to work on the the modeling of uh, we're making good progress again after a while after a, an interval on the modeling of human cognitive processes and that is a really serious goal uh, it's a it's a goal of AI that <clears throat> it comes and goes it uh, AI was largely engineering for a long time it started out as largely uh, psychological modeling. There's now a lot of data coming in from uh, neuropsychological modeling, neuropsychological data gathering that right now is not of immediate benefit to the modeling but it's going to be. And uh, it's a good time to be getting into that field to try to figure out more of how a brain functions. Now I'm not talking about how the physical brain functions as much as I am talking about how the the mind operates in this machine called the brain. So uh, more work on that area, this is a good time to do it. Another good thing to, that I predict will be uh, coming along is uh, in the artificial intelligence, the engineering part of our field, not the modeling of cognition part of our field. The use of AI programs to uh, find complex relationships in the immense databases that are being collected right now. Another way to say that is it goes back to that original goal of Lederberg's in mind to do science by machine. Uh, I talked to a, a researcher at UC Davis last weekend at the National Academy who was working on a gigantic uh, data collection experiment in astronomy, astrophysics. With his sensors were just pulling in like 50 terabytes a minute or something like that. He Just huge. And he was saying what I really need alongside of all of this is, and, and could, he was asking me if I could supply it, he says I need a good guessing machine because I can't look at all of that data. I need something else to look at that data and basically come up with good guess, what, what Polio would have called the art of good guessing. Uh, we would call clever hypothesis formation. There's going to be a lot of that. Uh, we're not going to get the Einstein in a box, but we'll get a lot closer to the Einstein in a box in the, in the next decade or two, and that's a very good problem to work on. Now, notice that I'm talking about structural conceptual relationships among concepts in the data. I'm not talking about <clears throat> superficial relationships such as you see emerging from these Bayesian models or from the neural network models, Don, that you mentioned before. They don't give you any insight. They just give you a bunch of numbers attached to nodes. And that's not an insight. That's not something that a, another theory can build on. Okay, now what about for the... Not, okay, let me... <clears throat> I, I just wanted to say, even though I'm not in the field of artificial intelligence, that, that I, I also can recommend people to go into this uh, because all, all through the years, uh, people working on artificial intelligence, from my point of view as, a, as an outsider, uh, uh, it's, it, it's, it has, has great value because you're working on a very hard problem and because you're working on hard problems you're going to build tools that people like me are also going to be able to use because in order to solve your in order yeah. to solve those problems you, you you're going to think of of something that I wouldn't think of solving working on an easier problem so that's yeah which is true and it happened it happened mm -hmm. almost on day 1 with the invention of list processing languages yeah 
And no one set out to just invent less processing languages. They set yeah. out to do a certain kind of computation, and it was just yeah. horrendously difficult to do. Yeah, without well, IPL5, I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't know how to solve all kinds of, yeah. of, of, of combinatorial problems. And the other thing was McCarthy with his uh, insight about time sharing system. McCarthy was interested in seeing machines interact with people because that was in his, in his artificial intelligence genes. That's what he wanted to do and there had to be a way to do it and he, he thought of time sharing as a, as a technique for doing that. So uh, then I think um, for, the, for the people who are way out there, the 50 to 100 year old, hundred years from now, people. This is a game, what I'm going to propose is a game that I'm not going to win and you're going to win because you're going to be alive and I'm not going to be alive. But it's the, um, it's the question of will we have fully explicated the theory of thinking in the time of your lifetime, not my lifetime? Uh, will all the questions be answered? Will we understand it? Uh, will we understand all the processes that go on in the same way that physics strives to understand? Uh, when, when they talk about the standard model in quantum mechanics, they really mean that they've got it nailed. They've got virtually all the questions answered. Now, of course, there are mysteries and mysteries and mysteries below that, but uh, it'd be very interesting to see what you people of 100 years from now know about all of this. Uh, a hundred years is an enormous amount of time in scientific time. So uh, what, I, what I do feel about computation is that, that uh, we get into the habit, of, we have gotten into the habit of depending on exponential growth in the amount of computation, bang for the buck, that we get out of our, our computers. Once we're in this habit, we're not going to lose the habit. We may say that we're running out of gas on Moore's Law, but someone's going to find some other paths. Uh, like, for example, recently we, we may have uh, slowed down on the Moore's Law side, but we're doing faster than Moore's Law on the storage side. So and we've traded off, we made some trades in the, in the computation in favor of storage, and we're going to continue to do that. And so uh, we're still going to have the amazing wonderland that, uh, that we've had over the past few decades uh, in, in computing. Uh, and now the question is conceptualizing. Are we going to be able to get the big picture right? And you guys will know, and we won't. All right, well, too bad we can't be with you, but, but uh, anyway, we wish you all the best. <laughs>